Welcome to the Decolonizing Education YouTube channel. Today we're talking about autism and we're looking at it through an intersectional lens. I'm going to start off by asking my guests to each introduce themselves. Lincoln, could you please start us off? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I'm, I'm Lincoln Tapper. I'm the parent of a son who is now 14, who is, who is autistic. Um, previously, I worked um, as a learning mentor, personal advisor and careers advisor in schools in West London and in Hertfordshire. And um, as part of that, I also worked as a special needs careers advisor um, prior to leaving my job a couple of years ago now and becoming the main carer for my son. Brilliant, thank you. Danae? Um, so I'm Danae Wellington. Um, I'm, well, I was just recently diagnosed with autism um, last August, uh, or September, sorry, last August. Um, I'm training um, a youth worker um, and I run a youth organization called Nayara. Um, yeah, that's, that's my introduction. Brilliant, thank you. Melissa? Um, Melissa Simmons. I I am autistic. I was diagnosed, um, I think about four or five years ago now. I also have um, two autistic children. Uh, one of them is almost 11 and the other one is almost 15. Uh, I am currently in my final year of a master's degree in autism studies, but because of COVID-19, everything is up in the air with that. And um, I've got a non-for-profit organisation called Miss Taught, and that is to educate the the uh, children, educate children on autism, also the wider communities, um, especially the black community. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So we've I follow all three of you on social media and you share really openly about your experiences of being autistic. So one of the first things I really wanted to ask you is how did you receive your um, diagnosis? And at, at what point was it? Was it when you were a child? Was it when you were an adult? So for Lincoln, for you, for your, for your son, when was the diagnosis received and what was the process like? Yeah, Alex was diagnosed when he was um, six years old. Um, he was picked up initially as having a speech and language impairment. Uh, that's where we first experienced pushback, where it was seen as he was too young um, to, you know, for us to be really concerned about his language development. Um, we then returned, um, my wife still being quite anxious about him, his very poor limited vocabulary um, then we did see a really good um, child um, speech and language therapist and she was the one who then sort of got us into the process of seeing a um, community paediatrician and then him being diagnosed after being first um, identified as having a global developmental delay so fortunately um, he was he was actually diagnosed quite early um, relative to the experiences of many other parents of children who are autistic. Mm, thank you. And Danae? Um, so for me, I was diagnosed um, when I was 26, so that was last August, but the process leading up to diagnosis took about two years to actually um, get onto the waiting list like it's a very long time of waiting and it's very much being in limbo um mm. and yeah I, it's a really difficult process to, to go through actually um but for myself i kind of noticed that um i started showing traits when i was quite young uh, so back in jamaica um but to be honest my my relatives and my mom at the time i don't think they they knew about autism or what autism was, so they wouldn't have even considered that um, an option. Um, but I had a lot of special interests when I was uh, younger, so I collected a lot of paper, um, a lot of books, um, and uh, I would 
I, I am what some people would call at a young age hyper like I think it's hyperlexia so mm. I had like a special interest for words mm. um and then yeah just kind of looking back and seeing my struggles being in and out of work not really having much stability and not really finding that I fit in mm. anywhere um within employment within education it was like wait something's going on here but I don't quite know what it is and it was my writing mentor, Vicky Morris, um, who's also autistic. Um, she's also got ADHD. Um, she, she said, Danae, do you know what? I think you should actually read, read up on this and see if, you know what I mean? if, if it's something that you resonate with. Um, I listened to her. And as soon as I started doing my research, it was like, whoa, hold on. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> um there's so much resonance here um and then it just kind of went from there really thank you melissa um my son was diagnosed at four and i felt like the worst mum in the world because i felt like i'd failed him because i didn't pick up on anything we went to jamaica for a funeral and when we came back from the funeral he was a little bit defiant he was a bit grumpy so he'd refused to sit on the on the carpet at school he had to sit on a chair and you know he wasn't talking very well and we kind of put it down to us feeling a bit we were, we were quite low because we'd lost a loved one mm -hmm. and we thought maybe that's why his behavior seems to have changed all of a sudden um so he was having speech and language therapy and it was the lady who mentioned autism I was distraught because it were to me, I, I knew of Rain Man and my sister, uh, my sister's childminder's son was autistic. That was the only two people I ever knew who was autistic and Rain Man isn't even a real person. So um, I saw it as a real negative and I was, I was really, really um, depressed by it. We got a diagnosis for him at four and I thought I'd failed him because I didn't recognize it for so long I didn't realize four is actually quite young it's very young to get a diagnosis um we were all there as a family as he was getting diagnosed uh, my daughter was in the room she was a toddler so she was one and I very distinctively remember the psychologist saying you don't have to worry about her she knows exactly what she wants because she's completely different to my son so um, I started to attend a, a, a Saturday club with my mm. son and we've, we've been there since he was four. We go every Saturday morning and I was hearing a lot about their daughters who were autistic and a lot of their traits I could see in my daughter. Mm. Uh, my daughter had got a diagnosis at six, which again is quite young, but I still felt like I'd failed her because... I was fighting for such a long time for it and the thing with girls is girls mask their difficulties and because the because autism the creation of it the the creation of the the name of it the observations were it was a cohort of middle class white boys mm. they became the face of autism decades ago and so if you're looking at that criteria in a little girl um you're not always going to see it mm. and so it's harder to get a diagnosis for girls mm. um i remember the first psychologist i went to with her said you know she can't be autistic because she she sits down in class um mm. you know if she was autistic she wouldn't be able to sit for as long as she does and and i was like yeah but she really struggles when she's at home I would ex I would describe it as uh, like a solar panel mm. so she would store it all at school and then as we got through the school gate it was all released mm -hmm. and they were they just didn't believe me um, finally I got to see the right person and I went in ready to argue and she said to me she says oh well girls mask it's harder to find in girls and I was able to relax I thought okay she understands so my daughter got a diagnosis notice at six mm. but in learning about my daughter through these families at the group I attended I could see traits in me mm. 
mm. and the stories that my mum told about me when I was little and I suspected I was autistic and um, I suspected my husband was as well mm. and he wouldn't go for uh, a test he wouldn't go and I said I'll go if you go mm. and so we both went and we both got a diagnosis on the same day so all four of us in the house <laughs> autistic four jamaicans in one house um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> believe you me and my son and my daughter are just polar opposites so if you know if you put my son as the face of autism my daughter would never get a diagnosis mm. if you put my daughter as the face of autism my son would never have gotten a diagnosis mm. um and so it's really, really difficult. Their needs are very different. Mm. And as a mum, I've got to try and cater to both their needs plus mine. Yeah. Um, it took me, it took two years for me to get a diagnosis. The waiting list was long. Mm. Um, but the, I think the frustrating thing I find is, because I'm based in Sheffield, if you live in Sheffield, you, you know it was two years to be seen if you yeah. lived outside of Sheffield and wanted to be diagnosed uh, that council from a different city would pay Sheffield mm. and it would take three months for somebody out of city wow so you know so so that was hard and I, I phoned up quite distressed a lot of times and said I will take a cancellation mm -hmm. and they said we don't do a cancellation policy so I just had to ride it out for two years, which was really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what happened with the school during that time? So at this point where you were already waiting for the diagnosis, but was, was the school able to offer support in the interim? I think the problem with school, with, with my son, before a diagnosis, they were putting things in place for mm -hmm. him because he was so disruptive. If he was stressed out and not coping, you know, he'll pick something up and chuck it or he'll scream at the top of his lungs, which is then disrupting the entire class. Mm. So things are put in place very quickly to try yeah. and combat that. My daughter sits angelically and does her work. Mm. And then when the bell goes and I'm there to meet her at the gate, she goes through the gate, she's a different person. Mm. so the screaming and shouting and the stress is all the way home in the car mm -hmm. and for the for the entire evening at home so when you're trying to tell the school there's something wrong at school yeah. and that's why we're getting the outbursts at home mm. it doesn't register for them um so with my daughter I've always had to do everything myself mm. whereas with my son I have had the help um for him Mm. So it's, it, um, again, their needs are, are different. My son, you know, he will happily, during this social distancing, he will happily vegetate at home, mm. in his room, chilled, happy. My daughter is really struggling because she needs to burn off that energy. She needs to be out and about. Yeah. And so, again, as a mom, I've got to cater for both of them. But also remember that I'm autistic and I'm struggling with things. And I have mm. to remember as well that I mask my difficulties. Yeah. And so I'm masking my difficulties to my kids um, to try and make them feel safe in this mm. stressful time. But that's making me poorly. It's making me ill. Yeah. And so I've got to then try and mask less to take care of my health. But I also have to make sure that I am still protecting and keeping them safe mm. and trying to figure all of that out whilst being stuck in this. It's really, really hard to do. Yeah. So, Danae, I'm just going back to the point that Melissa made about um, masking. Do you feel yeah. as that that may have contributed to such a late diagnosis for you? Um, definitely. I think that there is... I think it's also kind of dependent on how we mask as well. Um, for me, I'm kind of a natural introvert, so I spend a lot of my time um, um, just reading shut away in my room. But I think what is on the, on the completely different end of it, like I'm a, I'm a performer as well, so I was doing music from when I was younger. 
Mm. So to get on stage and to have this persona on stage, to become a completely different person, uh, mm. I think people wouldn't necessarily think that I was artistic. But the moment that I got off stage, I kind of went back into myself and found it really communicating. Mm. I struggled with loud noises in a particular environment, so I'd find a spot where I could just be by myself and just be because of yeah yeah and just li- being unaware right oh sorry um being unaware to a diagnosis mm. yeah and, you know what yeah and and lincoln so yeah absolutely so lincoln for your for your son did you um when before the diagnosis happened was the school offering any support or did they give you support once the diagnosis was received yeah so the journey was one where when he was at nursery uh, that's where initial concerns were raised and so he was picked up by the community um community educational psychologist or some no community senko who worked who worked with those organizations in the early year setting Mm. um but again that's where we first encountered difficulties because there was just a breakdown in communication they said to us that they had contacted us we have no record of that contact that led to us right making a complaint to Hertfordshire county council um and following on from there they then got back to us and they began to make move things forward but we just didn't have any trust or confidence in them we felt we were in um we felt we were being ignored really because our uh, we were just so worried about this child starting primary school Mm. and how his needs were going to be met and we just didn't feel that reassurance that we were looking for and in fact, that then led my wife, especially who's, um, you know, as, as you were talking about your own feelings of guilt and all those associated um, feelings that come with having a child diagnosed with, with a disability. Um, you know, so we then went off down the private school route. Um, and we, with hindsight, we realised now that was a mistake. But at the time, we just thought if we put him in a small school, he's going to be much better off than in this large 30 children primary um, where he's just going to suffer in that um, Mm. environment. Mm. In truth, the size of the class didn't really matter. What Mm. really mattered was that his needs would be, would be properly met. And and that was not really the case. Um, There was, the school tried to make some reasonable adjustments, but nothing that really um, was sufficient in terms of meeting his needs and and later on we decided to take him out of that school and put him back into the the state sector mm. which was the right decision to make and he was also happy uh, with that choice um, and in, that's partly to help us to get where we are today where so subsequently you know he was he, he has been able to get an education health and care plan um yeah. which you know with hindsight again if we had just gone straight into the state system he mostly would have got one from primary school rather than getting one from secondary school mm-hmm. um so the way the whole system works is very much if if you don't understand it then mm-hmm. like what we did you could end up fighting against it because you don't and no one's really helping you to understand it and sadly mm. so much of our experience of the education system has been one of of, of lacking support anyway it yeah. makes us very um doubtful of of people and their interests really and so mm. hence hence the decision that we made at that moment in time but i don't also have to add the point about masking mm. masking is something that i heard about years ago but didn't really understand how much it impacted on our son. Mm. And it's had a tremendous impact on him. 
Um, in, in fact, that he's, he's learned to act. He's learned to, to behave in a, such a way whereby he, he projects a certain persona Mm-hmm. and he he finds a degree of security in that persona the problem is is that it's a, it's an angry persona it's a distressed mm-hmm. persona um but for him it's saying to people leave me alone don't come near me i'm okay um and and in saying that he he it's meant that right now he won't be returning to his secondary school mm-hmm. um they're not even sure what's going to happen next and I think for me, that is where the the element of race really comes in, because you already have the label of particularly young black boys being mm. disruptive within the school space. And, and now you have the performance of masking where he is deliberately behaving in this way because it's a source of security for him. He knows totally. what he's doing. But totally. but from a school perspective, that's present that's showing the school. Okay, there's a stereotype here that is being fulfilled right in front of us. Yes. So what yeah. what, impact, what impact? Sorry. Is that? No, go on. Sorry, Melissa. It's weird because with my my son's school, when it, yeah. in year six, no, it wasn't year six. It was year um, three. So the transition from um, infant to primary is is the same school, but obviously they're expecting more work yeah. from you. So I was quite blase about his diagnosis because he he always kind of behaved. Um, he was incredibly smart. Where one of you know other children would be messy or want to do a lo- loads of things, my son would be, happily play by himself. Mm-hmm. So, um, but then year three, all of a sudden, more was expected from him, and he really couldn't cope with it. And so his behaviours changed drastically, mm-hmm. and one day we had to be called in for a meeting and um Mar- the headmaster apologized because he says we're failing your son and he kind of reassured me that he would turn it around and i didn't realize at the time how precious that was because it's my first child i you just know what you know and you actually don't know a, a lot when you when it's your first child I didn't realize how many teachers and how many schools will do whatever they can to save their own asses Mm. and not admit when they're messing up. But I had this headmaster who spoke Mm. to me and my husband and said, we're failing him, but we'll turn it around. Mm. And so by year six, my son was where he was supposed to be academically. If anything, he was a bit ahead. So we didn't have an educational health and care plan, but we were fighting for one. And up until the May before starting secondary school, we still didn't have one. Mm. And we were just about to go to tribunal and had one. And him having that educational health and care plan has helped him to thrive at secondary school. Mm. Whereas my daughter will never get one because she masks so well. So for her, um my job is to just build her resilience because i know i can't physically fight again Mm. for my daughter i i almost had a breakdown for my son i can't do that again so i'm building her resilience because she'll be in mainstream school Mm. but i think you know when you were saying lincoln when you were just talking then about um how you thought going to a smaller school with a smaller class would help and it it didn't i just found it my son was in a school where it was one class per year and again i didn't realize how unique that was i assumed every school only had one class per year and then i talked to friends and they're like no we've got four classes five classes per year and so even they were able to meet his needs better because it was smaller He, he was able to know everybody Mm-hmm. but they still couldn't give him all the tools that he would need for secondary mm. and we shouldn't have to fight as much as we're fighting yeah so as a, as a black boy that was one of my concerns that um they're gonna look at his aggression and they're gonna assume he's a certain way and a certain type of person mm. and i think mm. teachers need to do more to know the child and to know the family and mm. to know what they can, what kids can and can't achieve. Yeah. Um, and it's about being more attuned with the pupil. And I think a lot of 
teachers are it's not that they're unwilling but I think they are they're not capable of doing it whether that's to do with time constraints Mm. or just their lack of um awareness around autism or about Mm. racial bias you know they need to kind of be more clued up but I don't know when they're going to find the time to do that Mm. unless it is something that is a passion of theirs yeah yeah Yeah. I want to add that, I mean, my son, he has a pathological demand avoidance profile. So what that means is that he suffers from extreme anxiety and is and is driven to avoid any demand that is placed on him. And those demands can be internal demands. They're not necessarily those demands placed on him by others. And putting him in, putting him in a mainstream secondary school we feel has has failed him because the demands and the pressures on those teachers and on each pupil has got greater and greater in the time that I've worked within education. And with that responsibility, a lot of the pressure is actually shifted down onto the young people themselves. Mm. And he's just not been able to cope with those demands. And alongside that puberty, and adolescence it Mm. really has just been a a really distressing time for him Mm. um, and for us I mean right now he's enjoying lockdown because he's he's not at school he Mm. doesn't have to face one both his peers as well as staff Um, he's quite content um, to 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 be in his room or be out in the garden um, trying to get him to do any work there's no way because he, he's seeking to avoid any of the demands that that school places on him yeah. and I think when we talk about early diagnosis I would say that there's a need sometimes for pediatricians to bring families back in we found it very difficult to get back in contact with our community pediatrician because mm. we feel that our understanding of him is totally different from the six-year-old boy that was seen eight years ago. Mm. Mm. Absolutely and I think going back to the point that Melissa said earlier on when you were talking about your your son receiving a diagnosis yeah. Melissa and you feeling as though as a parent that you failed can can we just go a little bit further into that because I would really am interested to know what the experience is of parents who are carrying on the the labor of trying to tackle the system and it almost feels as though you're you're working against the tide and and you're you're pushing for something that should be made readily available to you and support you anyway I think when you're a mum anyway um and you carry the baby I think more yeah, I, think I, think the, I mean, the significant thing for me, as I said, both working within schools and now very much being the parent carer working alongside the school, is the drastic reduction in resources. Mm. And it, it really is shocking to see how many... Um, Is it just yeah, me and you? Yeah, no, no, no. I think the the connection's coming back on. But go on, Melissa. What were you going to say? Um, yeah, as a parent, we feel a, a lot of guilt anyway. As a mom, no, you know, you may, you may, um, you may have drank alcohol when you were pregnant before you realised you were pregnant. You feel guilty for that. You know, you may have a fall during pregnancy. You feel guilty for that. So, guilt comes in parenting anyway. I feel. Mm. Um, you when 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 you don't understand autism and you don't understand how long it takes to get a diagnosis me getting my son diagnosed at four i felt like i'd missed out on four years of him getting his needs met mm. and yes, so i was really course. worried about that you know yeah. i was like oh my gosh i yeah. failed this child there's four years of work i could have put in to make sure he's happy and healthy mm. but actually even with a diagnosis there are so many families who are getting no help whatsoever Mm. um in 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 community health or at school Mm. and so i think a lot of it is to do with as a parent what you 
are able to do for yourself yeah um you know but you become an advocate instead of a parent and mm. that is a that's difficult so for the last 10 years there isn't it's a blurred line between what is me just being a typical mum yeah. and what is me being somebody who has to support my autistic children to make sure their needs are met mm. and um I'd, I'd love to just be a mom mm. you know I I'd, I'd love to not be worrying for two years leading up to them going to secondary school or you know have I made the right decision about the school they've gone to but I, ha I have those um that guilt sticks with me it stays with me the more I become educated um in the field of autism I don't feel as guilty because actually mm -hmm. I realize I've done a damn good job Mm -hmm. And actually, I've realised that at six, my daughter getting a diagnosis at six is really good. Yeah. Although it feels like a lifetime, but actually getting a, a girl getting a diagnosis at six years old is really, really good. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible to think that, but that's the reality. Mm -hmm. and, and my son getting a diagnosis at four is really good. And yeah. I've, I've, I've advocated for them. I've fought for them as best mm -hmm. I can. Um, but the guilt is still there yeah and and sorry um, Link, you're, oh sorry Danae, go on. No, i was going to say compared to melissa's and um, lincoln's experiences uh, as parents and mm. found that uh, the responsibility kind of fell on me as a child mm. like my mom was working with um young adults with autism but when i actually proposed to her that mom i think i am autistic there was complete kind of denial or kind of azaneness, like mm. how how can you be artistic in a way? And um, it it does make me wonder sometimes what the differences would have been if there was early intervention from mm. my parents or just the adults that were around me, um, yeah. because I was quite disruptive in school as well. Um, I, I struggled quite a lot in school. I was always in the mm. in the head teacher's office, um, but for some reason, nobody or none of the, the teachers around me saw that uh, or felt the need to kind of investigate what was going on. Mm. Just passed it and kind of to, to fend for myself and do for myself and to advocate for myself. Really, mm. um, it was quite interesting. Um, Lincoln and Melissa's. Uh, yeah, I just I do wonder what it would have been like having just kind of a parent take that interest, or do you know what I mean? Just more of a yeah. step to investigate what was what was happening. Mm. Yeah, and and let's say um, what I'd say today is that's that it's really normal to feel that when you get diagnosed as an adult. Yeah, it's, it's really normal to have a time of a lot of reflection and you know you go back and you remember everything you ever did wrong or every big yeah. mistake you ever made that brought you a lot of embarrassment and then you mm -hmm. say oh gosh yeah I'm autistic it makes sense now why I was confused about that or why I yeah. messed up in that mm -hmm. and it's it's normal to go back and think about and have resentments towards parents and teachers and doctors who never picked up on stuff. That's, That's something I certainly did. Yeah. And I, um, what helped me to forgive, I guess is the word I can think of was, um, I read Steve Silberman's book, Neurotribes, mm -hmm. and I watched him on Ted talk. And that's when I realized that up until very recently, the, criteria and the parameters for getting a diagnosis were really narrow yeah. so people like you and I we wouldn't have been seen as or believed to be autistic Dick, absolutely. And that's why we that's right that's why that's mm. why it never happened you know and yeah. I think our parents do have a responsibility um to have even if they couldn't figure out that it's autism but as yeah. a parent if something if your child's struggling with something as a parent it's our job to try and help them circumvent it try and help them overcome their difficulties mm. um, 
but they our parents would not have for a moment thought it was autism mm. and I, you know absolutely and i think because there isn't which is why i really because you're not educating children on autism you're also educating parents and the black community as well on what autism is and how it actually affects their children their children's story and how it can actually affect them as the fact that it just affects everyone mm -hmm. um, and people in different ways and yeah i, I think I definitely uh, went through that stage of resentment and I'm moving slowly past that now. Um, but then I think what's, what is key is that um, the community is educated on autism and neurodiversity as a whole. Mm. So that children aren't just left to either fend for themselves or to struggle their way through education mm. um, or struggle their ways through life. Um, because the sad reality is there is a lot of young people right now from the black community that are struggling. Uh, the teachers don't really care or are not taking an interest in making sure that they're getting the support that they need, even if they don't understand what's happening, mm -hmm. but at least implementing something so that they're investigating uh, what's going on. Um, yeah. Mm. So education needs to be both within schools so for teachers to understand that there is um and there needs to be an intersectional look at autism and the impact Absolutely. of race and gender in the way that it presents and the need for assessments appropriately um yeah. but also education within the community mm -hmm. around what autism is so that parents are more informed lincoln were you going to say something no i just want to add that when it comes to the wider community that that increasing understanding is vital because many parents um, just feel very isolated mm -hmm. and when they do speak to people they tend to come across the usual type of stereotypical comments about autistic people mm -hmm. and and that in itself really does make you feel like you're having to educate everyone you meet yeah. And that is it's really frustrating because you do just want people to, especially family. I love it when families use their initiative mm. and go and say, if I say something to them, they go and do their research and they come back to me and they say, oh, I understand this now, I'm more informed now. Mm. That really helps us because it means we're not having to educate them at the same time. Mm. It means that yeah. they're genuinely interested in us as well as in our son and, and it makes a tremendous difference when that is shown um, but I think that really comes down just to the individual some people genuinely want to know more and yeah. therefore are very willing to go and do the research and, and, and increase their knowledge and then use it in a very appropriate way to support. Mm -hmm. so so where does that education come from so you lincoln you said on an individual level the onus might be on individuals to do that research but then what can we do at a, on a structural level and for institutions particularly within like schools within the education system what needs to happen to build in that education where do we start i think i think from the from the highest level it has to begin with, not, it isn't even just a whole school approach. It has to be an approach that goes nationally, you know, county-wide. It has to be something whereby understanding autism is something that is embedded within the fabric of institutions because of the significant numbers of people who are autistic and who are genuinely struggling to navigate their way for a world that feels hostile to them. Mm. So, you know, the, the strategies have to be one where people take ownership mm. and that has to be through senior leadership mm. taking ownership and taking responsibility yeah. to say that this is something that yeah. is a major issue for us because I believe there are many pupils who are autistic who, who have never been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. In fact, I worked, at a, I worked at a top boys school in Hertfordshire where they openly admitted that maybe as many as 
10 to 15 percent of the boys in the school are actually autistic whereas only five percent have actually got a diagnosis mm -hmm. so therefore the need for a whole school approach around diversity and neurodiversity is essential it isn't just meeting the needs of autistic pupils is meeting the needs of many other pupils Absolutely. who come within these within these d d definitions mm -hmm. absolutely melissa were you going to say something i think um when it comes to schools and institutions i think we have to remember that um the the leadership team is still tends to be white mm -hmm. and because of that and because autism is an invisible disability before they see a disabled child in front of them they're seeing a black child in front of them That's and there's been countless studies about mm -hmm. racial yeah. bias yeah. and yeah. you know institutional racism whatever you want to call it uh, so and, and, and it says that you know they tend to be harder on black children they tend to have misconceptions of black children those children tend to be um excluded expelled suspended so if we have all these negative things geared towards our black children you know our kids don't really stand a chance of getting what they need in these institutions mm. until yeah. there is a drastic change in the institutions mm. and unfortunately yeah, i don't see that happening anytime soon mm. because even the big autism charities when you when you see the leadership teams you know oh, wow. they're white mm. they will have a token black person to talk for them but very little is done when you look at the um the parliamentary um board at meet for autism they're white i mean there are there is a, a black woman on there she's really good at what she does but that's one person mm -hmm. so you know that and people always talk about these hard to reach communities no we're not hard to reach, to reach. It's because the people on the boards mm. don't look like them why am i going to want to sit and talk to you about my difficulties when i know that your thoughts are, and opinions of me are negative mm. i'm not mm. going to trust yeah. people to come into the community who don't look like me I, I don't trust you're going to fight for me that's not me saying that that's me thinking about the community as a whole mm. yes. you know mm. um and so there has to be real change. The, even when I like, I'm constantly on Twitter, constantly ranting to myself about the conferences, um, all the scholars around all, autism, they're all white, they're all middle class. There has to be those drastic changes. Mm. The people speaking at conferences and doing workshops need to look like me. Mm -hmm. they need to be black they need mm -hmm. to be asian they need to be more representative of what's going on in the uk yeah. and we just don't have that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it, there mm -hmm. won't be change until until we can change that and i don't know how we can change that mm -hmm. absolutely do you know what your thoughts um just kind of following on from what what melissa says uh has been saying um whether we're going whiteness um, uh, more black leadership in you know black leadership in these executive positions so that our community feels safe so we have what actually communities and having these conversations I feel like if if a system change already and then there's all the question of sorry oh, Dene. sorry Dene, the connection was weak then can you repeat that oh.
can't hear anything. Yes, yeah, so I think you've, I think you've just frozen. So I just want to go back to a point, Melissa, that you said earlier on when you were talking about the the distinction between the experiences that your son was having and the experiences that your daughter were having was having, mm. and the need for you to support her by building her resilience. Mm. Can we go? Can we just go back to that point a little bit? Because I think when we when we talk about intersectionality a lot, um, the the way that we look at race and gender together, we sometimes don't take into account the fact that as women of color we even without the diagnosis of uh, autism we're masking in a lot of spaces we're performing in a lot of spaces what impact does it have on your daughter as you're building her resilience to talk to her about race as well as to talk to her about the diagnosis of autism that she's that she's got what's the challenge of that my daughter is much smarter than I'll ever be at 10 and um, we have the most amazing discussions about um, you know inequalities um, injustices and you know she considers herself a womanist and she's been saying that for a few years now so she's very she knows who she is and so I, I I had to make a decision not to fight for the educational health and care plan. Um, yeah, I had to make the decision not to do that and to build her resilience because I knew that she was going to end up in mainstream school, in mainstream classes without the support of the integrated resource that my son's in. Mm. So she's going to have to learn to get from class to class and to cope with the bells and to cope with... Um, the children and the noises and the you know different expectations from different teachers and so it was about empowering her and making her feel like she is enough mm. I want to ensure that no matter what happens at school no matter what crap she faces or encounters that she knows that as a as a black woman as a black young lady she is enough mm. and you know, they can't, they can't break your spirit because mm. we have as people endured um, so much and we're still standing. Mm. And so that's kind of what I, I try and build that strength in her. Um, we, she really, I mean, we did what all parents do when you've got little black girls, you, you know, you try and make the hair look pretty every day for school and you put in the lovely bobbles of different colours and mm. It used to be hard with her hair. It used to be really, really hard because we didn't realize that she had um, sensory issues because we didn't realize she was autistic. Mm. So combing and brushing her hair was stressful. Washing her hair, stressful. So what we've done over the last two years is we, we gave her permission to grow dreadlocks. Mm. And so she's been growing dreadlocks and then I started to grow mine after her. Mm. Um, and it's awoken this really strong, independent young lady in her. Mm. You know, she loves being unique because she's the only girl in school with dreadlocks. She loves that. Um, she loves how it makes her feel. She loves not having that pain in her head anymore. Um, she's just so positive about it. But just the things that every black girl goes through, like, you know, when you have the white girl that touches your hair. Mm things like that she yeah. experiences but whereas I would have just let it happen and talk to them about the products I put in my hair and she will very firmly say you don't touch a black girl's hair mm. she will tell them and she will tell she'll tell the girls in school she will tell the teachers she will tell the parents whoever mm. tries to put her, their hands in her hair she tells them mm. and it's little things like that I see this strength in her that I wish I had when mm. I was her age uh, and for my son, like friendships aren't really important. You know, they all kind of, they're in a group in the IR. They all play on their um, Android phones and they've all got uh, Game Boys and, and mm. they all play. But it's not like friend, a friendship in the true definition. Mm. Whereas friendships are really important to my daughter, but she struggles with them. So I'm having to kind of teach her about friendship so when mm. she comes home complaining that this girl said that and that girl's done that mm. then we spend the entire evening discussing it and saying well 
you know, maybe this girl is struggling because she feels uncomfortable with such and such. Mm. So I'm trying to teach her to sit on the fence and uh, be a kind of critical thinker Mm. and, um, you know, never show her cards until she has her own opinion. And it's, I'm trying to teach her things for life. Mm. Um, so for me I think she's wise wiser than I was at 10 and wiser than I was at 21 actually Mm. um but I think for my daughter that was the best way to go for her Mm. and oh link so Lincoln's back on um Lincoln what I really wanted to ask you and I'm just curious to know this is how was your how has your relationship with your son changed since the diagnosis and as, and as a parent what are some of the the challenges that you encounter and some of the opportunities that you encounter in your experiences of parenting a child um that is autistic um yeah the challenges are, are numerous and i think particularly because he has pathological demand avoidance mm. so you know peculiar traits of it is that he he has always struggled to understand the difference between the parent and the child relationship. Mm-hmm. He sees himself very much as being uh, equal, mm-hmm. and expresses himself as as our equal. Mm-hmm. Um, which, when it therefore comes down to setting down rules and responsibilities, is just extremely challenging. And in fact, we've totally had to reverse our whole parenting approach because mm-hmm. of his his demands but also because of the quite severe meltdowns that he has had mm. um, which have been very distressing to to witness um, but also the fact that it, when he has had those meltdowns that has also led to um, very very upsetting behavior which can be directed both at my wife and I as well as being directed at himself in terms of self-harm, suicidal ideation, and so on, um, it has meant that for us quite some time we we just thought we just live on eggshells at home because mm. we're very constantly aware that we have this child who 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 can who's being triggered by many different things, and that there, there just needs to be one more thing to occur. And that leads to him having having a severe a severe meltdown. You know, mm-hmm. we're one of those many families where you know we've had to hide all the knives in the house. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we've had to take quite drastic steps in terms of making sure we maintain our own safety. Um, mm-hmm. But with greater understanding, has led to a less reactive response. So, mm-hmm. for example, before I was used to label his behaviour as challenging Mm. but then I realized he wasn't actually challenging me or his mother what he was doing was he was acting out of his distress Mm. so his behavior is distressing behavior rather than challenging Mm. and yes it might appear to to those on the outside but all he's doing is projecting his 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 frustrations Mm. and his feelings which he cannot manage onto ourselves and 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 that again as i said things like that really can can make a difference um i think Mm -hmm. it's important that you know right from the outset i mean i was very i was very fortunate to come across the autism um group who are based at sheffield hallam Mm -hmm. university Mm -hmm. and um i can't remember his name luke bearden Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I went to a talk that he did at the National Autistic Society in the same year when Alex was first diagnosed, and he talked about being an autistic person, mm. and that for me was totally transformational, illuminating. It, it led me from rather than seeing autism as something that was wrong with my son, it brought mm. me to the place where I could just see him as an autistic child. Mm-hmm. And and therefore that that has helped us greatly, in fact, because we're not seeking cures, we're not seeking remedies, we're not seeking to change someone. We're trying to say this is who you are, 
um, and the things that you do. For mm. example, he, he his self talk, which um, can go on for very 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 long periods of time, mm. but it's part of him being autistic. It's how he processes and discusses and reviews his day and interactions and so on and so forth. So I come to a point where the more you understand, the more sensitive you are. Um, and sometimes, I mean, like right now with his education, he clearly is just not a place where he can engage in learning. Mm -hmm. And as heartbreaking as that is for us, it's, it, I think it becomes more important that we recognise, but that's just where he's at. Yeah. You know, being within the education system has has burnt him out. It, it, in some ways, it may have caused elements of trauma to him mm. as he's tried to navigate something that is totally not set up for someone with his particular profile. Um, you know, he, he mm. tries his best, but as I say, when you see and you hear how other children behave, then it just sort of throws everything up in the air. Well, if so-and-so can swear at a teacher, then I'm gonna swear at a teacher, you know? Mm. Uh, even though he knows the consequences, it's, it, there can be a degree of, well, they do it, so can I. And mm. it's that lack of, uh, it's the lack of understanding of consequences, which is very worrying. Cause mm. you just think, unless you understand the consequences of your actions, then, you may end up doing things which you really would would have known not to do mm. because you I, know yeah and i think at the moment because of covid19 and everybody being at home and parents feeling a sense of responsibility to homeschool i think what we're starting to see is that there are a lot of young people who have had really traumatic experiences within schools and are now seeing this time as a respite from that and, totally. and so homeschooling isn't isn't working for them because what they're going through at the moment is almost like a recovery of what they've been that's experiencing right. yeah. at school. Mm. Yeah, it's a really good way of viewing it actually. And um, I mean, it might it seems so on PC, but you know, he goes, "I'm I'm happy for the coronavirus." He goes, "No, I don't mean that literally, mm. but you know, I'm not going to school." <laughs> Mm. Yeah. yeah. So my son's definitely um because the head of the IR, which is an integrated resource, um, phones every week. And I, you know, my son says actually he's preferring working at home because he can get things done better. Mm. Yes. And he says actually every parent he's spoken to, his the kids have said that they prefer working at home, they're in their own space, yeah. they're not having to worry about teacher expectations and, you know, interacting with the other children and the noise and everything. So for him, actually, this isolation is working really, really well for him because mm. he likes to be in. Whereas with my daughter, because she is a completely different child, she is worrying that she's like, so for the first week, um, everything had to be like to time. You know, mm. it's like, well, at school, we do this at this time, mummy, and it, it's, and then we have dinner, and then we do that. And I had to kind of very rigidly stick to it. Mm. She's starting to thaw out a lot more. So we're having more time just in the garden, pottering about, yeah. talking about spirituality, just different things, more holistic. Mm. But she's saying she's worried because she's not done a lot of work this week. And I had to kind of, again, have those conversations and say, you know, well, actually, I disagree because you know we talked about she talked about she believes everything has a soul mm. um because we we're talking about the plants and inanimate objects and you know then she started talking about what she believes and mm. i said actually that's that's learning mm. what you're doing there i says we're talking about spirituality i says yesterday when we looked at motivational quotes and which ones we enjoyed i was like we were thinking critically and we mm. did you know we were doing writing handwriting i said so mm. You know, education doesn't have to be sat at a desk. Yeah. So she's she's having less stomach ache and headache because she mm. has that every day when she mm. comes home from school. That's mainly why the wow. screaming happens in the car. Yeah. Um, so she's having less stomach aches, she's having less headaches. And I had to kind of bring that to her awareness to say, you know, you're not having as much of them because you're not worrying as much about school. Mm. So she's a child, even when she's poorly. Uh, sorry 
that's I think that's a Sheffield word poorly even mm-hmm. when she's ill mm-hmm. um she wants to go to school because she doesn't she's worried she's going to miss something mm-hmm. that might be in in the SATs exam yeah. so even after we go and see the doctor you know she wants to go back to school so she's gone from that to now having to be at home and we don't know when you're going to go back to school mm. and it, it was really difficult for her at first but she's gradually relaxing more um and I'm grateful that she is more relaxed mm. and I think even though there's a lot of uncertainty about time where we are going to get to a point where we're gradually going to go back into schooling and mm. so what my hope is during this time is that there are a lot of teachers and a lot of parents that use this opportunity as, as a chance to just reflect and think about how we could transform education so that some of the practices that young people are being able to experience at home actually make their way into the school space so that we don't have to have these spaces of respite where children are actually comforted by the fact they're, that they're not in school but be thinking really consciously about what is it about the school space that feels traumatic to some children and what can we do to support them better? And I think, as you said earlier on, Melissa, that comes with education. And as Lincoln said, learning, the more we learn, the more that we understand what the needs of particular children are, the more compassionate we're able to be and the more we're able to change our practices so that we're supporting them better but i think because of the government we have you know i think even though i'd say lots of teachers want to do things like that anyway Mm. but the government we have i i i don't have much faith in them and i feel once this is over i think we will quickly forget and i Mm. think very soon the government will be you know they're wanting to push us back into industry you know, because we're, we're losing money, we've got mm. to get back, we have to make profit. Um, schools are, you know, you, you, you get paid per, per head. Mm. So I think it will go back to finances, uh, less time, uh, more output. And I think very quickly we'll go back into our old ways. I mean, for me and mm. my daughter being a year six, this time she should be doing a transition, yeah. a gradual right. transition. So she should be having several trips to a new secondary school um she should be you know having um special days out with the kids she's in class with now Mm. for them to have their goodbye and a a good ending and all of that has gone Mm. so one of my concerns about us getting back into school is what is her transition going to look like are they going to expect her to just start secondary school you know is she going to have a goodbye party at her old school and it's little things that for, I, I, I think for everybody is nerve wracking, but there were so many parents before outside the school saying, oh, what secondary school are you going to apply for? Oh, I don't know. And I thought, oh God, if that was my only worry, you know, mm. I've been researching schools for two years and last year I went around eight schools. Mm. So I had to do a lot working up to her getting into secondary school mm. and and now the, the tran the transition is it's going to look very different mm. to how we thought it would be and I have to remember I'm still autistic and I there's still an element of me that has rigid yeah. thinking mm. and kind of I had planned things to be a certain way and now I have to adapt to this ever-changing situation so that I can support my kids Mm. that's that's kind of my worry about what what happens when we come out of this Mm. I think all schools will be on go slow initially yeah because I think this has caused so much trauma it's going to cause mental health problems for our Mm. children yes and that's not just autistic children that's all children Mm. you know it's this has been really traumatic the news is traumatic yeah and so I think they are going to be, they're going to slowly transition kids back into school. Mm. Um, And I just hope that, I hope that we get out of this as a family without too much educational distress. Mm. Absolutely. Lincoln, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just think the, how the school system has changed 
especially over the last decade. Mm. It has created a, it has, the institution has evolved into something that for many young people is just harmful. Mm. And, even, and, and sadly, even though I say many kids leave school really with I survived it rather than I thrived there. Mm. Yeah. Because learning isn't so much about the development of the person, it's just about the acquisition of knowledge. Yeah. Oh, Lincoln, I think your connection's cutting. It's frozen. Oh, your connection's frozen. Okay, so I'm just going to wait for Lincoln to just catch up with us and fix his connection so that we can finish off the discussion. But I think a lot of the points that both of you are hi have highlighted so far is really about what we can do to ensure that children have the best care over this course of COVID-19 um, and ensuring that even though there is going to be a slow transition into schooling, there's a lot of work that needs to be done by the institutions to support that transition, but also for parents to be able to be, really think carefully about the support that their child needs as they transition back into school so that, that they, they're not returning to a space, as Lincoln said, that's harmful. So what, what that support actually looks like. Um, Lincoln, do you want to see if your connection's improved? Sorry, we didn't hear your final point. Back on. Yeah. I can't, uh, can you hear me everyone? Yeah, we yeah. can hear you now. I didn't hear your questions. I don't know why it just didn't come through. Oh, it's okay. It's just you were talking about... Um, One second. The, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so you were talking about how the education system's changed over the last decade to become a harmful space, and then your connection cuts after that. So... Sorry, can, say it again? So you were talking about how the education system's changed over the last decade. Yes. And how it's harmful to a, a lot of young people. Yeah, no, absolutely, because, because expectations are so high, mm. which is coming from parents, which is coming from the teachers, which mm. is coming from the, the society, the cultures, yeah. even the different ethnic communities. There's just such high expectation, which is great. I mean, I grew up in a time in this country where expectations about education were very, very low indeed. Mm. So it's, it's fantastic that our value of education has increased in itself. Mm. However, there is a price that's being paid by young people with the pressures that are being placed on them, as we're going to see right now with those young people who haven't been able to do their GCSEs. Mm. What, what are they, what are, what are going to be the actual grades that teachers decide um, their, their work and their attainment has merited? Mm. And, and, how, and how is that going to make young people feel within themselves if they feel that they're, they're, the opportunity to prove themselves in an exam has mm. been taken from them and mm. therefore that independence has been lost and now I'm reliant on a teacher and we're, we're, you know, we're all very aware of how biased, um, mm. racially biased teacher assessments have been uh, for yeah. generations. It's, it's nothing new. For us to to know about but it does for me say that you know as we return to normality mm. um it will be interesting to see how each school individual teachers to what extent head teachers to what extent their experience of this mm. can bring to bear on the government yeah. and upon their schools really meaningful change because mm. there's no doubt about it this whole experience will have um, had such a tremendous impact on us all mm. that to really go back to the way things were surely would be a failure 
on yeah. the behalf of all those involved in the education of young people. Yeah, and and to be honest, I uh, Melissa, I completely hear your your reservations because of the current government that we've got. I, I completely agree with you, but I, a part of me is also agrees with Lincoln that there it seems like there, there is actually no way we can go back to the way that things are because we can't ignore the consequences of COVID-19 on exposing a lot of failures in the system I think it's exposed a lot to us we can see now where that there are, where there are gaps where appropriate support isn't available where um, schools are being required to do something that they haven't been designed to do mm -hmm. and so to go back to the way things were it doesn't seem like it's it's feasible because of what we've we've gone through as a nation but as you said there is sometimes selective amnesia yeah. and there there is for political reasons for economic reasons some things may be prioritized more than others so i think we are going to have to just wait and see but what mm. my hope is for in in creating spaces like this where we can have dialogue is that educators listening in can hear the experiences of parents and particularly parents of children that are autistic but are looking at it through an intersectional lens so that they as educators can actually reflect and think about what they need to do in order to provide appropriate support but also to gain the education and the knowledge that they need and not assume that um, they can go into the classroom colorblind. Mm. And I think, and I think that's the biggest worry that we have with the teaching profession at the moment is that we race isn't a part of the conversation, and mm. if race isn't a part of the conversation, the conversation then yeah. we can't we can't expect them to understand and talk about disability, talk about autism through the lens of racial disparity if we're not even having a conversation about race. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I just want to thank you guys so much for contributing to the discussion. I know we had some issues with connection, but the discussion was so helpful and so insightful. So I just want to thank you again for all of your contributions. Thank you. Thank you all thank very you. much. It's been and great it was lovely to meet.